God of War is one of the most successful game franchises of all time. It's hailed for its violent storytelling and massive uses of QTEs, quick some events for people that don't know, and for its cinematic boss fights fully capturing the scale of the game and actually making you feel like a god. Of War and at the forefront of this series, we have our main character, Kratos, who is beloved, but there's been some discourse surrounding him as a character. Ever since God of War 2018 release, we saw Kratos' character take a shift from how he once was. Reviewers, players, critics, everyone all around came to the conclusion that God of War 2018 finally gave Kratos a character. Except he always had a character. Kratos was always simplified as being angry all the time, and while his rage is his most notable trait, Kratos was always a multi-layered character dating back to his first game in 2005. But because he lost a notable trait of his, people believed that he was actually given a character and saw his character from before as one-dimensional. We're gonna look back and see how Kratos, while he evolved from how he used to be, was always a character written in grief, anguish, sorrow, and his overwhelming will to keep moving forward. We first see Kratos about to take his first step off a cliff, in a cutscene that was memed to high heaven. But this was a moment for him when he was at his lowest point. The gods that he's put so much faith into have turned their backs on him when needed most and he's plagued by constant nightmares and torment. He believed death could be his escape, his release. Kratos, having given 10 years of servitude, wishes to be ridden of his constant nightmares that plague his mind, and all throughout this game he must go on trial after trial to put his mind at ease. Kratos was a man of many faults. He was once a proud general over his army but grew overconfident. A man hungry and thirsty for power. He felt that there was nothing greater than standing atop your enemies. A man fueled by violence was once at the mercy of his enemies until he made a deal with Ares. This deal changes Kratos' life forever. Kratos, in exchange for such great power, became a slave to the god of war Ares, a mindless drone sworn to killing indiscriminately. And with these acts came a day he would regret it for the rest of his life. Kratos, having raided a village, slaughtered dozens and dozens of people until the last of the people that he would take out would be his wife and daughter. It was then when he made the decision to rid himself of his servitude to Ares and take him out, to put an end to the horror. Ares believed that Kratos now having no family to look after, he will have no ties left and he'll be able to become exactly what he wanted him to be. At this point, Kratos is a character writhing in torment. For all the rage that has consumed him, you don't understand why the man is so upset. He literally has his past transgressions forever on his skin until the day he dies. Revenge was his only option at this point. Notice how I said it was his only option. Kratos felt like he needed to do this so he could end his nightmares and put his faith in the gods to be able to do so. Even after he destroys Ares, the gods make a deal with Kratos but there was a catch. The gods forgave Kratos of his sins but couldn't rid him of his nightmares. They never were going to get rid of them. The sins were too great for them to just be washed away. Kratos was on a fool's errand. So when reality sets in, Kratos believed that game ending himself would be the final answer. Kratos has more reach than just being angry, his blind faith in the beings that he believed would be able to solve his problems. After all, they're gods, with the ability to do anything but not in this situation. So when he leaps off the highest point, the gods do not allow him to die but instead place him as the new god of war. While he has the status of a god, he's still drowning in misery. But let's rewind the clock a bit to a different game, one that also expounds upon the character of Kratos. A little game called... Chains of Olympus takes place within the 10 years Kratos has spent serving the gods, and this game is very important to Kratos' character, as it is one of three games very personal to him dealing with his family in the forefront. And God of War 2005, you see the ramifications of his deeds, but this game has him dealing with his deeds personally. Kratos once again being led astray by the gods on a path to his nightmares, but this time, something catches his attention. A melody is being played by a girl, who we find out is Calliope, his daughter that was slain by his hand. She appears at points throughout the game, and this always takes center stage. It's something that gives his life meaning. Kratos during this time has grown tired of being the errand boy, being told that his dreams will come true, but he just has to do this one thing. It's like when telemarketers call you and say, Yeah, so everything is in order, you just gotta put down your credit card info, social security number, and birth certificate. All of that nonsense. Kratos isn't some mindless drone, he's fully aware of what's happening and notices that he's essentially being used, but he still retains hope. Kratos, upon meeting Persephone, asks where his daughter is and she tells him that she's fine in the Elysium Fields. Of course, Kratos wants to see her. Persephone says this is possible, but he has to cast aside all of his sins and godly power at the Forsaken Tree, and he'll be granted passage to the fields. Naturally, Kratos does this so he can see Calliope. Kratos says he doesn't care about the wants and needs of humanity. All he cares about is seeing his daughter, which he does. He then tells her, I am here now, child, and I will not leave you again. Remember these words because in a few moments it will come back to bite Kratos. 
Persephone tells Kratos her grand scheme to kill all of the gods due to them essentially betraying her, how she had to lead a life she didn't want and marry a man she didn't love. Do you think it was my choice to wed a man I did not love? Live a life I did not choose? I was betrayed by the very gods that once saw me as their own, but no more. Once the pillar is destroyed, the world will revert into chaos. She released Atlas and his goal is to destroy the pillar holding the world along with the gods in it. Ultimately everyone dies including Calliope if this plan is carried out and this is when Kratos is left with the choice. They say characters can be defined by the choices they make. Hell, even people are held to these rules. Kratos is left with a choice to make that by no means is easy. In fact, it's the exact opposite. If Kratos chooses to stay with Calliope, then the entire world is destroyed, leaving him and his daughter to die along with it. Or he can choose to stop Persephone and Atlas from causing the end of the world, but has to abandon Calliope forever. Kratos has fought and slain thousands to get to this point. To be able to get back to his family that was wrongfully taken away from him. He finally gets to see his daughter, but the reunion is short-lived. Don't forget that Kratos said that he cares not for the wants and needs of man. He very easily could have chosen to live out the rest of his time he had left with Calliope, to die with his daughter essentially, but he doesn't choose this. In what might possibly be one of the most fucked button mashing sections you'll ever have to do, you have to mash circle to push your daughter away, the one clinging on to you begging you not to leave her. This is heartbreaking. Kratos' journey was at its end so to speak, but he knew this wasn't the right way to go about it. Kratos has to hear his daughter cry that she won't see him again and he has to come to the harsh realization that it just wasn't destined for him to achieve his goal. All of the lies, all of the killing, all of the bloodshed, it could have meant something had he been able to be with Calliope again, but it was all for naught. Kratos now again has his rage well up inside him now more than ever due to this situation. I always point to this scene as one of Kratos' defining moments because this is one of the only moments where genuine happiness was had for him, as brief as it may have been. It's this choice that tells you the kind of man Kratos is. Even though he will never see Calliope again, he'll know that she's here in Elysium. This is the one thing Kratos wanted and he made the choice to leave it behind. Not only is this great tension for the scene, but great character writing for Kratos. For such an angry man that the people claim is his only trait, I don't believe a man like that could have made this decision. Kratos didn't do this for the sake of humanity, he is its savior but it's a title he doesn't care to have. It's something he ultimately had to do. It was a sacrifice he had to make. Even down to his conversation with Atlas after the battle of Persephone, Atlas asks him a question about what good is the word of an Olympian, and Kratos tells him, it's all I have, Atlas. I do not need the aid of the gods! But my path is now clear to me. I will serve them! And they will keep their promise to free me from my past! I ask you, Spartan. What good is the promise of an Olympian? It is all I have, Atlas! Kratos is a desperate man, he needs to cling on to something. Something has to work out for him. He has done too much for this to not be the case. So when we jump back to God of War 1 to see that the gods still can't give him what he wants, this puts it into an even greater context seeing as he was robbed of both seeing his daughter and shedding away those nightmares. Two things he was set on his path to do, and it ends up in failure. Ghost of Sparta takes place after the events of Chains of Olympus and God of War 1, but before the events of God of War 2. This time the game focuses again on familial ties with Kratos, but this time it's with his brother Deimos and sheds light on Kratos' mother and Spartan upbringing. Kratos and Deimos would usually train for upcoming battles until one fateful day their village was attacked. The oracle stated that a marked warrior would bring about the destruction of Olympus. The village was then raided by Ares alongside with Athena. Ares captures Deimos and Kratos would never see him again which is also due to the fact that Kratos' mother lied to him about the fate of his brother. She then tells him that there is still time to rescue him, which is exactly what he intends to do. Athena warns Kratos that his path to save his brother won't do him any good, and she mentions the gods, and again Kratos talks about the lies that have been told his way, and that he's done with their word. It is not a wise course of action, Kratos. It was a dream, nothing more. The visions still haunt me, Athena. The visions you promised to take away. But this vision, I can change. She claimed that Deimos was a threat to Olympus. Kratos realizes that Athena aided Ares and wondered why she didn't help him and that she should have helped him, but then adds to it and says, I should have helped him. You were there. Why? Why did you help him? I was there for you, Kratos. 
You had to be saved. You should have saved him. I should have saved him. Kratos told Deimos that a Spartan is always ready and willing to fight, that their back never hits the ground, but in that moment he wasn't strong enough to act. He couldn't have stopped Ares, not at that point in time. He holds on to his guilt that there was something he could have done, but he believes that he can do something now by saving his brother. He'll be able to make up for lost time. His guilt will be overwritten by the fact that here and now, already having killed Ares, he can act and save his brother. It might be long overdue, but he has the ability now. Kratos eventually frees Deimos, but he doesn't get the reaction he had hoped for. Deimos resents Kratos. He laughs at the idea that he's safe now because none of this should have happened to him. Kratos had the mind of a general since he was a child. He tried to instill that fire into Deimos. All of those things he was telling him about Spartan honor seemed to have blown up in smoke because Kratos did nothing to help his brother, that he turned his back on him due to how long it took for him to even do this. Nothing ever comes easy to Kratos. Every time he's met with this moment of supposed reprieve, it is always quickly snatched away from him. A man always searching for an end to his torment is never allowed that luxury. Kratos and Deimos fight, to which Kratos after a point doesn't fight back. He lets his brother wail on him. Deimos even asks Kratos to fight him, but he just doesn't. You left me! Get up! Fight me! You, Kratos. For a character like Kratos, no one ever just beats him up, nor does he ever just let them beat him up like this. He always has to get his get back in the end, but this time, it's different. It's dealing with family. He feels like the beating is his punishment. He doesn't even fight Deimos with his intent to kill like he usually does with anyone he comes across. Kratos is always emotionally driven, but once again, his emotion isn't just rage. After the battle, Deimos is snatched away by Thanatos, and Kratos once again attempts to save Deimos, which he succeeds in. Even after the beating he took, Kratos is still willing to look out for his brother, to which Deimos acknowledges him and even recites what Kratos told him when they were children. A Spartan never lets his back hit the ground. Right, brother? I will not lose you again, Deimos. Remember these words because it will bite. Anyone get deja vu? Now the brothers have reunited to fight Thanatos, the one thing in their way. And here is where Thanatos brings up a very good point. He says to Kratos that nothing you do is of your own choosing, and he's right. That matters now. Nothing you do is of your own choosing. The gods do not decide my fate, Thanatos! Kratos, for everything he has done, has been at the gods' demands. For as much as he wants to make his own choices, they're always dictated by a god. Thanatos adds to that prior statement with, you are nothing but a pawn in a game that you don't even know is being played. The gods decide, and the sisters of fate make it so. You are nothing but a pawn in a game you don't even know is being played. Pathetic. Even though Kratos tells him that the gods don't decide his fate, these words will linger. Imagine you're a person with essentially zero agency over your own life. That was Kratos. During the battle, Deimos is slain by Thanatos, which awakens more rage out of Kratos and he bests him. Kratos buries Deimos and he approaches a cliff. He hesitates to take the plunge, reminiscent of God of War 1, and Athena approaches him. He tells him that he's let go of his mortal ties and that he can become a god, to which Kratos refuses. He even asks her if this is all just a game to her. He sits atop his throne, telling her that the gods will pay for what they've done. Chains of Olympus and Ghosts of Sparta are two games in the franchise that are prequels, and I'm not forgetting Ascension either, I'll touch on that in a bit. Chains of Olympus and Ghosts of Sparta help add more to the story and overall character of Kratos. If you've only played the main games, it might seem that Kratos is just a war-hungry and battle-driven madman. Even in those games, they show you that he's not, but still. Even though both these games sold well, they're not brought up in regard to Kratos when talking about his character by any of the critics or reviewers, mainly because they haven't played them. These games contextualize everything to further drive home the point why Kratos is so mad outside of just the gods lying to him and leading him astray. Anything Kratos held dear was ripped away from him. Every promise given to him was broken, every tale told to him was a lie. He was just a glorified errand boy of the gods to handle whatever dirty work they personally didn't feel the need to tend to. A decade of feeling this way would rightfully make anyone feel angry or upset, or hopeless. 
It was always disingenuous that people would flanderize Kratos as just a big angry man when he's this beautifully written character even before the soft reboots we got. Those games just hammer home how well written he's always been, not create the well written character that already existed prior. Even with God of War Ascension which came out after God of War 3 but was another prequel that said in the very very beginning, even before Ghost of Sparta and Chains of Olympus, in this game shortly after Kratos game ends his family, Ares made an oath with him that Kratos would soon disregard due to the death of his family. Ares would then have the Furies capture him for his disobedience. Orcos, being the Oath Keeper and son of Ares, betrays the Furies in order to side with Kratos and wants to help him on his journey to rid him of his bond with Ares. This game, Kratos isn't riddled with visions of his past but yet illusions of what life could be. At every point, Kratos refuses this because he'd rather live in the reality he's in with the choices he's made. Kratos was then told by the Oracle Aletheia that the only way to free himself of his bond with Ares is to kill the Furies. Now we know to take whatever the Oracle says with a grain of salt because there's always an asterisk to these prophecies, as we've seen in Ghost of Sparta. Fast forwarding to when Kratos is able to fight the last remaining Furies, they attempt to trick him in the form of his wife, but Kratos rejects this again and takes them out. This is another situation where Kratos could have taken the easy way out and lived out a lie, but being the safety of his wife and child, but as we all know, living a lie is no way to live, and Kratos does not want that for himself. Kratos takes out the Furies and returns to Sparta to be with Orcos, who then tells Kratos he was made his Oath Keeper by the Furies because, in God of War, everyone is extremely petty. Kratos is left with once again another awful choice. Either he lets Orcos live but remain bound by Ares, or kill Orcos, which then frees them both of the oaths that bind them, but he loses a friend. Kratos, of course, for their sakes, has to take out Orcos, which he really did not want to do. If there's one thing about Kratos' character as well is that he's very much a person big on loyalty. If you do right by him, he will do right by you, which is why he helped Gaia as much as he did in God of War 2 into God of War 3, until she, you know, said he was useless. Listen carefully, Kratos. You were a simple pawn, nothing more. Zeus is no longer your concern. This is our war, not yours. I say this to say though, that each of these prequels build upon the ever so vast world of God of War but also Kratos. His spiral into madness is justified because you've seen the lengths of what happened to him on numerous occasions. In God of War 3 he's able to finally exact his revenge on the gods that have tormented him for so long and he wipes out every single last one of them. Granted, this decision is also not the right one either as he has doomed the entire world into chaos, but then at the last second of that game, he takes himself out to release the power into the hands of the people, much to Athena's anger at the decision. This is a final gotcha to the gods that no matter what, nothing dictates his life anymore and he's able to live by his own means and die by his own means. Sorrow, regret, dismay, sadness, pity, guilt, anguish, all of these things can be attributed to Kratos but the one that gets talked about the most with him is rage. The games are marketed around this aspect and it got everyone hyped but this isn't the end all be all for Kratos. It's just that now with his new life with Atreus he's able to assess everything, to see where all of his faults and what revenge led him to. The events of God of War 3 was his fault and the world suffered for it. Kratos is a heavily flawed character not because he's poorly written, but because his character is meant to be this way. You can understand him, you can disagree with him, but you ultimately see why all of these things happened. Kratos was fueled by several emotions and he holds himself accountable for them. Hell, there are things that happened before that he still has to pay for. You will always be a monster. I know. But I am your monster no longer. He doesn't even think of himself as a good person even to now, but wants to be a good parent to Atreus. Kratos wanted to be a great parent to Calliope as well, but circumstances deemed otherwise. It always astounded me how many people ran with the narrative that Kratos was this extremely one note. From how people made Kratos out to be, you would have thought he was gaming's Broly. There's nothing to the character except fighting, when it was so far removed from the truth. To the point where you have to ask, do we even play the same game? It was so bad even that people would go so far as to say the series grew up, as if to say that what we played before was so childish and now the new game serves as something more palatable for adults. I never understood this narrative. It doesn't seem right to me that so many people allegedly played these games for hours up to completion and the takeaway was, big man swing blade, big man kill, big man rage. It's interesting too because even with OG Kratos, he acknowledged at several points in his life that he's shocked at what he's done, constantly questioning himself, how he doesn't even recognize himself anymore, who he even is at the end of the day. All of these things were present as far back as these games went but God of War 2018 and Ragnarok have apparently given these attributes to Kratos. Him tackling these issues doesn't mean Kratos didn't acknowledge them prior. 
Kratos was always driven by his family to act. He's always cared for them. He just happens to care more for Atreus due to the actions taken with his past family. Kratos is a man of constant sacrifice, always giving but can never take. All of these things that Kratos has gone through emotionally, all of the loss, suffering, and pain. Yes, he felt rage in these instances, but this didn't overshadow every other emotion he's had. The man felt aimless, always being told what to do. Even during his initial fight with the gods after he took up Poseidon, even Gaia tells him that he was a pawn and nothing more. Something that was told to him before by Thanatos. Kratos and Gaia were allies united, driven by their goal to exact revenge by the gods themselves, a being that Kratos put trust into that betrayed him, right when he was able to confront Zeus, the main person behind the anguish. It was always disingenuous to label Kratos as the rage guy. God of War 2018 and Ragnarok are phenomenal games with stellar writing across the both of them, but it shouldn't be praised for giving a character to a character who already had character. The game's expounding on him you can 100% commend it for, but we can't say it conjured up a character when it's building off of what was already established. God of War is one of my favorite video game franchises of all time, easily top 5. I have owned and played all of the games. Kratos' journey has been compelling from start to finish across all of them, to see what more he can go through, what more he can take, what will be the ramifications of his actions, who will stand in his way now. It was always extremely interesting. I had this idea in my mind for a while, even before I decided to make this channel. It's just something that bothered me which is funny to think about. I just didn't like the downplaying of great writing before in favor of what we got today. I also wanted to touch on before the end of this video that the original creator David Jaffe apparently doesn't like the direction taken for Kratos. Which is certainly a stance to have, and he more than anyone is very much allowed to have whatever stance he has on it. After all, he created the character, but in fairness to the team at Santa Monica Studios and for the games, this had to be the direction taken. There's nothing else more plausible for this character. I understand the stance of keeping a character interesting without progressing them, and while that is possible and has been done before with media, Kratos had to come to terms with his actions this way. You doom an entire world to hell after the events of 3, I imagine he'd be thinking to himself, damn what the fuck did I really do? To some it may seem like Kratos is going soft and that he's too emotional, but he's always been emotional. Kratos was driven by emotions to do everything. It's just that rage wasn't the only driving force, he's always loved his family. The argument of Kratos going soft is pretty much the inverse of people that said he was just a guy that killed and nothing more. Both of these groups are saying the same thing but for different reasons, but all in all, Kratos is a wonderfully written character. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I hope it shed some light on our boy Kratos because he's too great a character to just get downplayed like this, and I hope you all see that too. But anyway, that's enough out of me. What do you guys think? Let me know down in the comments and I'll be seeing you all next time.